Hello and welcome to episode four of Violin Chats. If you're new to my series, Violin Chats is where we gather to talk about everything to do with the violin, becoming a better violinist, talking to great violinists, and discussing topics that are of interest and relevance to violinists and other musicians. Today's topic is a really important one. This conversation is about what it takes to become a 21st century musician, specifically what it takes to survive and thrive during rapidly changing times. Let's face it, we're in the middle of a pandemic and our industry is changing before our very eyes. I think this topic is extremely relevant and pertinent to what we are all going through right now. And I'm really excited to have two great guests here who have donated their time for us and are going to be sharing their wisdom. So before I introduce them, I would like to ask a question to everyone watching today and even to those watching later in the replay. I would like to actually ask you to imagine yourself you are a classical musician. Imagine yourself a year from now, or possibly two years from now. Imagine that you are creating music that you love to play or to sing. You are reaching audiences that are enthusiastic to find you and listen to you. And you are making a great living doing it. I would like you to envision this and know that this is very possible, even during this time that is changing so fast. And many of us are struggling to, to know what to do when we have lost many out of our performances. So with this vision in mind, I want to ask you, I would like you for you to type into the chat this answer. Do you think that in your musical training, are you prepared well enough for the realities of the real world, of the classical music industry, and how to become a survi surviving and thriving professional. Please, please, please type in the chat what you think about this topic. Now, as you type, I'm going to introduce to you my two friends and colleagues, Dr. Caitlin Boyle. Dr. Caitlin Boyle, you might recognize as my surprise guest from last violin chat. Caitlin made a surprise appearance in the quartet violinist with Dr. Ming Jung. Caitlin was the violist in the Celia String Quartet, and Caitlin is now a freelance violist in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And she was also a visiting assistant professor at Western University, where she taught a career skills course called the 21st Century Musician. And my second guest is Tracy Friedlander. Tracy is a freelance horn player based in Raleigh, North Carolina, US. And from what I understand, she will be based there for very much longer. She is also the creator and founder of Crushing Classical, as well as the Crushing Classical podcast, which interviews classical musicians who are forging brave new careers that buck the conventional classical music paradigm. Tracy is also a business coach for musicians and she specializes in helping people build audiences and increase visibility. And in fact, Tracy is my business coach. Thank you so much, Caitlin and Tracy for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having uh, us. <laughs> I'm super excited to hear what you have to say. And I think our listeners are going to be extremely grateful for what you have to say. So please, please type in your questions. Um, Caitlin, I would like to start the conversation off with a question for you, because I know that you taught an entire course to young musicians who were at, in university. And you taught and built a whole course on the career skills that they need to know to make it in the classical music industry. I don't think I actually took course, a course like that when I was in school. So I would like to know what you taught them. We covered a, um, a whole range of um, topics in our course. Um, three topics that kind of um, come to mind um, that, that the students found useful um, were that they developed personal uh, portfolios. So this was this kind of outlined um, uh, 
it, your, it included your bio and your resume and a concert history in your repertoire list, uh, list and also had um, a headshot. And then we actually made that into a website um, as well, because there's all these online platforms that you can uh, use to just plug in information. Now they've made it really, really simple to do that. Um, and we also, another thing that we did was that we, we talked about um, the elevator pitch or developing kind of key messages. So I think that this is actually really important because we spend so much time in music school um, learning how to play your instrument because it is very difficult and, and it takes uh, many 10,000 hours of, of study to kind of accomplish this. But one thing that I do find that, that is sometimes missing is kind of why you are doing this or what it is exactly that you want to be saying with, uh, like with classical music or through uh, classical music. And um, I think like kind of what goes along with that is programming. So developing um, really like interesting and engaging programs. Um, usually I think for uh, people's recital, they're like, oh, I have to do, you know, this like very technical piece and then a romantic piece and the classical piece. And it's, it's great to like study all the styles and genres. But I think if there's like a, a deeper story or like a connection that you, you have um, that that is something that can be um, is really important to be explored. Um, and another thing that we did in the course, um, which the students found uh, helpful, what were inter um, informational interviews. So we actually um, you reached out to someone in your field and kind of asked um, about what what is it like being a professional musician? Yeah, like what is the school kind of not um, teaching me about. And I think that that was really eye-opening. Um, in the course, we had a whole range of, of voice types and, and, and instruments. And I think, you know, depending on uh, which voice type or instrument you are, it is that like the, the different um, options that you have for a music career are a little bit different as well. So, and then we also got into grant writing and finances and um, how to like start your own music studio. So it was actually, um, and how to apply for, for tours and stuff. So uh, yeah, I was thinking about it this week and I was like, yeah, for each of those things, we could actually do kind of a whole course because we kind of just kind of skimmed um, over a lot of those topics that I think you could go, that can really help people like develop their own um, career. Another thing I wanted to mention too was like about networking because I, 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 when I went through, I actually took like quite a few or three or four, you know, careers um, in music uh, business management courses. Um, but and they always really, really emphasis networking. But to me, this always kind of had like a little bit of a negative connotation because it's like, be nice to someone and then they'll, give you what you want a little <laughs> bit like even though like you don't necessarily have to take it that way no but then i remember towards yeah i remember towards the end of the the course we kind of i kind of talked a little bit more about developing a musical community i think tracy that's like along the lines of, of what you're kind of do because also for these students that were graduating i realized that the school um was a wonderful like that was their network. Those were their people. And then they were gonna be leaving that that school. And so it's kind of like, um, so like what happens to that network? Or like, yeah, how can you build and develop your own um, community? So we didn't actually touch on that in, um, in the course, but um, again, like just also in terms of like, yeah, your support system and how like, I know, Lynn, you also mentioned like like having a really good mindset and um, because it can be um, like hard as a musician because it, it's challenging being up there on stage. And like, um, I know a lot of people like have to deal with nerves and all that, those kind of things too. Up there as well. so, Absolutely. Actually, now, uh, oh, we have got people saying hello. Okay, hi, Carol. Hi, Lisa, Lisa's from, yeah, hi, hi, Neil. Oh, we do have a question actually. Um, yes, Neil says, they, these are great topics that are taught in that, those are great topics that you taught in that course. 
you really need to be taught how to survive with the skills taught in school. And I totally agree. What you mentioned about networking, you said, okay, your initial reaction was, oh, you're trying to be nice to someone so that they will help you or give you something or help grease the wheel for in some way for your career. But I like to think of the, of networking as relationship building. And, and actually, I want to ask Tracy what you think about this, because I believe you, you're going to be a really good uh, opinion on this. Yeah, I mean, maybe the word networking is outdated. I mean, it's a good word to use, I suppose. But if I think back to the beginning of my career and what I did, I was networking, but really, I was just meeting people. And I was just playing for people because I needed you know, their feedback on how I was doing. And at the same time, you know, like I was preparing for auditions, but also that was an opportunity for them to hear me play for the freelance scene and things like that. So I guess that's what I was doing, but nobody nobody told me you have to go out and network. I just knew that I needed to know people because that's how you get invited to play, right? If that's what you're working on, like a freelance, the freelance side of things. But I agree. Yeah, it's it is a community building. You're 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 building the people that know you, and that's how you do it. But I I could see how that that word could be taken as a way of like as sort of like a negative. Like here you have to do this thing, so hopefully people give you stuff. You know. Well, I, I know. I'm curious now because. Well, actually, Tracy, what do you think about music schools and the education that we get in terms of building careers? I mean, Caitlin, you've taught this. And Tracy, I know you have strong opinions about this, but I personally yeah. know that I've never, ever attended anything educational that taught me networking skills. And now I realize, oh my God, where did I learn them? Did I learn them? Have I learned them? Do I even know how to do this? Do I need to improve? I feel like we need a workshop stat like right now in school. Yeah, and you know, I mean, Granted, I graduated a long time ago. You know, I got a master's degree 20 years ago now. So minus a few more years for undergrad, yeah. like they, they just were, they were like, our job is to teach you the instrument and this theory stuff. And then you're on your own, right? Like, so school has definitely evolved and it's a good thing it has. But then there's all the people like me and you, Lynn, who and Caitlin probably too. Like when you graduated or before you graduated, they weren't teaching that stuff. So a lot of people figured it out on their own, but knowing that it needs to change for the people that are entering a job market that's frankly a lot more difficult than when we were coming out. Um, it's good, it's really important that they're starting to teach those skills in university now, yeah. Caitlin, so you're you're tapped into the present educational field, and I have my taste as well. Do you think that schools are are giving enough to our present musicians, training us to be better, um, let's say, survivors in the in this world of where we need career skills, business skills, and networking skills? Do you think that it's sufficient? Um, I would say. I mean, I think it's yeah. It's always kind of. Oh, now I'm trying to be politically correct. Just something that you can improve upon. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I think that we, uh, like a, a lot of the feedback also that I got from the course was kind of like, like wow, like we haven't, like a lot of this was really new information for them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, actually I was having this discussion with a good friend of mine, like I'm not sure if like when those skills should be taught just because it does take so long kind of to master your instrument. So it's true. Like um, for third and, and fourth year, like if you do need to spend all of that time, like kind of honing your craft and then, or if it should be like also introduced all together so that you're thinking about it earlier. But I mean, hmm. um, but also, yeah, from my perspective, like I like yeah the whole computer like yeah because when I I we didn't have like email like I think email came out like around the time that like when I was in my undergrad so it's a yeah it's a whole different world and like um, just how you can kind of use the um, all the different social media and the the stuff online to to like promote um, your projects and like yeah and what you think is, as well like I'm um yeah i'm a i'm a bit rusty on on those things for sure because it's, it's it's also like an industry that's changing so fast as well right however you mentioned caitlin the the, the necessity you were teaching the elevator pitch i mean tracy I, 
do, do you recommend that every single musician, whether they're first year in their studies or, you know, like really late into the studies, have that elevator pitch right ready to go, right from their back pocket at the tip of their tongue all the time? Is this what we need to get to? Well, I can tell you that I didn't know what my own elevator pitch was for a while because sometimes that evolves. Well, it, it should always be evolving, right? Because your, your elevator pitch at 19 is not going to be what it is at 29 or 39 or whatever, you know, like you're always going to be growing and changing. But, and what I teach in the audience building side of things, I think it actually helps you to come up with what that is that you feel strongly about what you stand for, what you're building, because as a 19 year old student or 20 year old student coming out, I'm not sure what, what you like had them work on exactly, but you know, if they're, if they're like, Hey, I'm a soloist who really feels strongly about that. You know, we have to create community engagement or education is a thing, you know, like maybe that's what they're creating like that quick few sentences about what they're about. I think that's a great practice because you can't, and, and I'm sure you had a lot of students going, well, I don't know. I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. And I think that the next step is you make it up what you're out about now you're, yeah. as, as you start practicing and talking about it and doing it, then it evolves because you experience that and you go, oh, but I really like this other thing. And that's really much more a part of it or whatever. So I feel like you can't just be like magic wand elevator pitch. Like you also have to do the things so that you know what you're what you're about essentially. And I think a lot of times that's the mistake. Like at least my point of view, not not that it's a mistake to to learn this, but my mistake was that growing up in college, I thought that the pinnacle was all I needed was a really great job that I could be in and I was set for life and I didn't have to think about it or worry about it anymore, which is totally wrong thinking. Like who there's very few people who are, who sit down in an orchestra chair and don't leave for 50 years. Sure. There's lots of them. A lot of them were my teachers. And so that's what I thought was like the ideal, mm -hmm. but in reality, a vast majority of people are, do not live their lives like that. And so I think this elevator pitch thing is also connected to, getting in reality of what different kind of career paths there are and what's possible to create. And then you can, and then you can see how that would evolve over time when you start to explore and experience other things. Like maybe you're, maybe you, when you're graduating, you think that you're all about education or chamber music and education or something. And then you do a year abroad and you're like, wait, for me, a big part of it would be that I travel a lot or whatever, like all of a sudden I learned that about myself. So I think, I think it's definitely an evolving thing and it's, it's a really cool practice though. I think it's a really good exercise to do. So I think it's great that you're teaching that. Yeah. So it's okay then to sort of, um, to sort of question where you are. Like basically you can have a draft, a working draft of what you are and be prepared to to sputter out that working draft when you get caught in an elevator. Is this what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. definitely when you're in an elevator. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, <we're> an escalator. I do feel like you're right. Like what you said, the working draft. Like I really, when someone says they don't know what they want to do, that is a state of mind. Okay. You can't, you got to know, you got to just decide that you know what you want to do and then know that that can move and it evolve. But if you sit there and go, I don't know what I want to do, then that is, there's nowhere to move from there. Yeah. You just have to pick and go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, like I had a, I wrote a post about this because um my husband was teaching a student and she was trying to decide between a really expensive prestigious school for music school or a state school that was going to give her a full scholarship it, as a music major as well and i and i said oh let me have let me have a chance to talk to her parents please and um when i when i had a chat her parents and and my husband and the student were in the room and i said what do you want to do and she said, I don't know. And I said, 
you have any idea? Do you want to try out for orchestras? Do you want to be a soloist? Do you want to be a freelance musician, chamber? What is it? She goes, I don't know. And I said, then do not go six figures into debt for a college degree that you don't know what you want to do with yet. Like that. Point. Is, That's a good point. So have an idea. And if you really legit don't have an idea, then save your money until you really do, I think. Right. You know? I agree. I'm just going to quickly just scan through who's here and say hello. Hi, Ina, and hi, Mickey. Uh, Carol says, I think you need to put yourself in the path of experienced musicians. I, I agree. agree. Carol's in my boot camp, and this is awesome that she's here. You know, speaking of the elevator pitch, okay, so we're just making the assumption that everyone knows what an elevator pitch is. Yeah. But for those of us who are kind of going, I'm, af I'm afraid to raise my hand, what is an elevator pitch? Can you please explain to us, what is elevator pitch? Why is it so important for a musician? Anyone? <laughs> well, my, uh, yeah, I was, um, so I, the idea is basically, I think that you can kind of sum up yourself and what you want to do um, like in two or three minutes. So if you happen to step into the elevator with someone um, famous in your field, uh, that you could network with or <laughs> just introduce yourself to in this case, or you were stalking that famous person into the elevator <laughs> and you basically had two or three minutes to kind of, yeah, pitch them your, like introduce yourself really quickly, pitch them your idea, maybe throw in a little bit of credibility, like I've already done this before, and then kind of ask for also like a follow-up like could I email you to talk to you about this further or um, to, to meet with you or play for you or, or something like that. Um, yeah, so I think it's being able to also like communicate very quickly and clearly what you, what you, who you are and what you want, basically. In my mind, I always think of elevator pitch as a very succinct one or two sentences. Is that, is that right, Tracy? Is that how you think of it as well? Um, I guess so. If you're writing and, and the person's going to get off at the next floor, you probably have to be pretty fast. Yeah. But if you're outside of an elevator, you you want to be concise and you want to be clear about what you're what you want to get across to them. One thing I want to add to is that say um, like if it's a situation, if I'm going back to like you know when I was in my 20s and I say I got in front of the teacher who I really wanted to study with, and so my elevator pitch had to be like I really admire your work. And I know you would be a great person for me to take lessons from. And how can I, you know, what's the best way to get in touch with you? And do you have room in your schedule to for, to hear me? Like, I, my goal is to have a job like yours or to be, you know, some something like that. Hmm. You, you want to put them in the place of, like, if, if it's all about you and what you need from them is attention, then I would say that the first thing you should say is, hey, I really love your work. I admire it greatly. I really, I have your recording of Mahler 5 with Schulte and I listened to it until the CD practically broke. Like you need to tell them that you admire their work and you know their work and it would be, it would mean the world to you to get in their world. Okay, that is brilliant, Tracy. I think that's basically elevator pitch taken to the next level. I love that. <laughs> I love that, Tracy. I think I'm gonna jot that down somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and so, if it's if it's like that, usually, if your ele your elevator pitch, I would think, is something around, I want you to know about what I do because I need something from you, or I want you to to take like to buy it or to like help me in some way. I think it's really important to remember that they they don't care about you yet because mm -hmm. they don't know you. So you, flattery is good. And being educated about who they are and what they've done is very important. If you go, hey, you know, I, someone told me you were cool, but I never heard you play before, but, you know, can I play for, that's not going to sound good. Like, you're going to be like, what? Who are you? You know, yeah. I mean, the difference between someone asking me to be on my podcast, hey, uh, I have a person and this, that, and the other I want them to be on your podcast. And I go, or someone that says, hey, I've been listening to your podcast for about a couple months. I've been just devouring it. I really, my favorite episode was this. 
I love how you stand for musicians who are creating unique careers. And I have a great idea for someone who could be a guest who totally fits in with the narrative of your podcast. That's when my ears perk up. Right. I'm like, they're paying attention and they know what I need. And they're getting what they want, which is to put their person on my podcast. But if they're like, hey, I have this person and they're a concert pianist and this, that, and the other, and they won this award and they got chosen at an early age from age 18. And I'm going, well, that's nice and cool, but the people who listen to my audience or the people who are in my audience who listen to my interviews, they're interested in people who created their own. So how does that align with that? Does it or not? You know, maybe they didn't do their research. Or I had somebody write to me and say, hey, I have a great guest for you. Here they are. And I thought, and I wrote back and said, those people have been on my podcast already. Thanks. You should have done your research, but also I'll have them on again because I love them. But isn't it funny? Like, hello, you should have read that. You should have looked it up, right? Oh my goodness. Okay, so, so I'm just going to actually just pause to ask the people who are watching right now, does anyone have their elevator pitch ready to go right now? I'm curious. And if you do, I would invite you to type it into the chat in oh, two sentences. Start to type out who you are, what you stand for, what you do. Please introduce us as if you're doing an elevator pitch right now. And in the meantime, I'll just read what people have said here. Okay, so Carol says, I'm glad I went to state school. I have no regrets about staying within reason on what I could afford. Staying closer to home helped me begin to make connections and get on freelance lists. It was an easier environment. You know, Carol, that's similar to what I did. I elected to stay in my country. I almost went to the United States for school. And if I had done so, I would have been in mountains of debt. Uh, okay, so Ina agreed. Yes, okay, so Ina agrees. Because of that, I had my tuition paid for the same, paid for the same year as graduation. Me too. I paid yeah. my debt. Yeah, I tried to pay my debt and my, my parents did help me, but I, as soon as I graduated, I paid my provincial loan. Neil has a question for you, Tracy. Uh, at Tracy, great advice to spin that elevator pitch into something that appeals to the person. The elevator pitch's advice is really helpful and useful and applies to all vocations. This also is good advice for job interviews. I totally, awesome. I totally agree. I really like that. I think that was elevator pitch 2.0. I'm totally making a point <laughs> to remember that. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> um, and another thing, oh, Lynn, can I jump in for a sec? Another thing that I, like, I was thinking about the whole elevator pitch, too, was, like, how you can kind of make it, make them into key messages. Um, I, I learned that term from, like, a, a media and communications um, instructor at Western that I did a course with, and she did this awesome presentation of key messages. But I think, like, a key message, like, also, Tracy, what you were saying, like, when you gave those two examples, you were so excited like when the person was like, I love your podcast and I've been listening to it. So you have like that emotional connection too. But yeah. I think if you randomly go to a dinner party or like an online dinner party, as the case may be these days, like often if you don't know the person, like they'll be like, oh, hi, so what do you do? And I think if you kind of have like your pitch or your message, um, I think you have to like totally change it depending on like who you're talking to. Um, but like, if it, it's also like, I think a way if you can also like get your project into like, like into a conversation so that you start start a discussion with someone, then like, yeah, I guess bringing it back to the whole um, networking or community building thing, like they might say, so I, I'm a violist, I could say like, I'm working on this project um, uh, where I, yeah. <laughs> I can't do my own elevator pitch. This, this project, this project where I'm I'm bringing awareness of like viola concertos that were written prior to 1850, and the and the person could be like, oh well, what is a viola? Like I don't know what a viola is, and then I you know you'd explain what a viola is, or they could be like, oh my friend conducts like a, um, an orchestra in you know in New Brunswick, and they're looking for for people to like to go play, and so that that would also be like a ra totally random connection. So you're also not like pitching it to directly to a person, but you, yeah, you have kind of like a project that you're an idea of what you're excited about. Yeah. Okay, so basically being able to articulate what you stand for, what you do, who you are, but also what you're passionate about and to whom the person you're speaking, what you're passionate about them. Is that, did I get all that correct? 
Did I summarize everything about elevator pitch? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> okay. So now we're talking about elevator pitches and why they're so important. So while we toil away in our practice rooms and in mastering our craft, we have to remember that we have to be able to articulate, network, and build a community and build relationships. So I assume this is all to increase the chances of leveraging these people in our lives, right? Because we don't know where, as I see it, most of us, many of us are trying to either build a teaching studio or try to win an orchestra audition and make it into some kind of secure income. But what happens if that doesn't happen right away, especially now in year 2020 with COVID-19? So what's an elevator pitch going to do to help someone who's out of work with in an orchestra situation right now or someone who's in school right now thinking i want to audition for an orchestra soon but right now there's no auditions so i want to know what you think about what are these what are the skills that we need to just harness right now so that we can get ahead into this career that is so rapidly changing i'll say some stuff okay ah. I think that in this situation right now that we're in, other skills are really important to hone. If you have a ton of time available and you don't have uh, as many classes or you don't have orchestra rehearsal, really go for enhancing your other skills, your writing skills, your ability to, to do, use social media. Maybe it's web design. Maybe it's anything internet-based. Like... If you can develop a skill around that, then you can have um, income streams that aren't tied to your instrument. Because if you're just starting out right now, you it's there's not a lot of work. There's not going to be a lot of work. So you need to develop other skills. That's my bit, most important advice I can give to any college student right now. That's what I... It's 100% what I think people should do. I 100% agree with that, Tracy. And I have had these conversations with a few students of mine. I've been, I've been gently encouraging these young, younger generations of musicians coming up and saying, well, you really want an orchestra job? Hey, look at me. I got an orchestra job. Do you want to be me in my situation right now? Right, right. now, I've got zero gigs on my calendar. Zero. Right. Do you really want an orchestra job? That's my question to right. you. Right. While you, are, while you are working towards that audition, absolutely take your auditions, use the auditions to hone your skills. Nothing hones my personal chops than preparing for an audition. And I understand that. I would say go ahead and do the auditions. But let's bear in mind the advice that we're getting from Dr. Caitlin and Tracy here, because outside of this one track that we've been conditioned in, well, I don't know about now in schools so much, but I think schools still are uh, training students to get down this narrow tunnel uh, mm -hmm. uh, in this industry, right? A narrow tunnel. These, these are the, our only uh, options in the in our industry. But I love how you, what you're talking about, Tracy. Like you're talking to musicians who are going left uh, left field and away from the traditional job paths. So I'm wondering, Tracy, can you just give a, a, us a sample? I'm, I'm sure some of you are probably listening to, to Tracy already. And for those of who are not, Tracy, I would love for you to give us a sample of who you've been speaking to and what kinds of things are doing. Oh, you mean on my podcast? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, let's see. There's some of my favorite examples are, oh, I always bring these the same ones up because they're so cool. There's one guy named Hunter Nowak who takes a nine foot Steinway out on, into nature and plays a concert outside for people with a Bluetooth headset. He's figured out a way to take apart the nine foot Steinway and have it on this like, like cool, I don't know what it is. It's like a stage or something. Like it's all worked out so that it's safe to do. And he travels with a tuner person and he it's all funded by grants. So writing skills are excellent skills to hone. And he talked about it on the podcast that learning how to write and, and request for grants is a is an untapped resource that most people don't know about or have the ability to do or even think of. Um, there's a, uh, a person who creates these improvised concerts that are meditative. It's called Mind Travel. The guy is named Murray Hittery. He was on my podcast. Love him so much. Um, let's see. I don't know. There. Um, 
my friend Shauna Tucker was on. She's like a cello singer, songwriter, um, music educator, like a teaching artist. And she's she's created a real unique career that that's like a, a touring a touring artist, which also has an educational component. So every everybody on there has created something completely unique that doesn't exist in the world already. And that's what I love about talking to these people because I ask them, what, how did you do that? What was your first step? What was your next step? What happened next? What was the hard part, you know? So Caitlin, you mentioned, uh, well, I mean, Tracy just mentioned grant writing. You, Caitlin, you taught grant writing. What do we need to know? Because as Tracy said, it's an untapped, virtually untapped resource. I personally find grant writing very difficult. And I do, I have done a lot of writing. I mean, as you know, we wrote a doctoral thesis. We know how to write after painfully spending hours at a computer. But what do you recommend for people who want to tap into this big resource? How, what do you need to know to get grants out and, and successful? Um, well, I think, uh, one really helpful thing is if you can find someone who has been on the jury of uh, one of the granting agencies um, that you're working with and, and ask if they would be willing to um, edit your proposal. Um, the, uh, this can be really helpful because I think it, it just it should like they, they really know what the like what the agencies are looking for. Um, and then also if you t if you look at the edits that they're making to your work and really try to study them closely. So like, yeah, like the types of language that they're using. Um, but actually a couple of like more practical tips for grants are that often juries have to read like hundreds of proposals. So again, you want something to be like actually very clear and concise and like maybe even like bullet points so that people really understand what what the project is that you're working on. And um, and yeah, again, like why, why they should give you money. So I think you also have to use kind of persuasive um, language, but that's very, very short and um, concise. Another kind of simple thing I think that helps with like improving writing skills is actually just reading your own work aloud mm -hmm. or reading it to a friend, um, especially who's not in your field to see if they can they can understand what um, what your project is to, um, yeah, those would be my- I, I think those are amazing tips. So basically take it to someone who's been on a jury and he's, has evaluated multiple, multiple grants, make it very concise, make it very clear and also read it out loud. Yeah. I love that. Those are really, really great tips. Let's just take a look. People are writing in, oh, great. Lots of elevator pitches coming in. Yay, awesome. Oh, good, people know what they are doing and who they are. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Look at this. Wow, okay, amazing. So now we've talked about elevator pitches and we've talked about grant writing. So. I'm personally interested, okay, because we no longer can really do live performances. And Caitlin, especially for you, you've done a lot of touring around the world for live audiences around the world as part of a quartet, right? Um, so I'm really curious now, this is a time of virtual audiences and virtual communication, virtual performances. What are we going to do now in terms of reaching audiences virtually? For me, in my, my personal opinion, is that social media is the way to reach audiences in bite-sized performances. We can do live stream concerts, but we can also do bite-sized performances through little bursts on social media. Like Tracy, what can you say about this? Um, yeah, I mean, it's everyone's doing it, right? Little, they're they're doing live streams, and you know, I don't know. I I have I think it's such new territory. How are we supposed to really know? Do you know? You know what I mean? I don't know. What do you think, Caitlin, about it? Yeah, I'm not sure either. I, I think like maybe YouTube has spoiled me in a way is that that like it's like I think the question is how how can you also get people to to want to pay to see yeah. live stream? Because there's yeah, there's just so much on YouTube that you can kind of watch for and free, but it's like and when it when this whole thing started, everything was free, and people were sort of scrambling to stay relevant. And then now, 
that's a little bit backed into a corner like okay we did that before but now we kind of want to get paid so yes. i don't know i i think that it's gonna be interesting to see how this rolls out and evolves i did talk to somebody um who's a music director of an orchestra in canada i'm not gonna like reveal it because i don't know if it's like out there yet but he said that there's something is being created where it is a series that you can purchase and it's not it's live streamed but only for the people who paid so it won't be free and it's a series so i think it's possible i think it needs to be created and i think the people who are creating it are, are the first ones to do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so patreon models i so suppose so because yeah. there's people like jacob collier and Ben Folds who have really big Patreon audiences and the people who pay get private, I don't know, downloads, recordings, things that aren't being released, I guess. So maybe that's the way. I think it has to stay um, like the, it, the, the offering needs to be um, just for the people who are buying it. Exclusive, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> like, what's that word? Oh yeah, exclusive. So that's just for the people who are like insiders or whatever. Yeah. And so I guess that's the way that you create that kind of excitement around it. So, so if this is the case, then then individual musicians would be at an advantage compared to larger organizations like ensembles, orchestras, companies, large companies like symphony orchestras, operas and ballets. Like we're talking about let's say a quartet, a trio, a solo artist, a duo. These people have the 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 advantage of mobility and adaptability, they, there's, well, shall I say, the like union rules cannot uh, inhibit smaller ensembles as uh, heavily as they can with larger organizations, right? I, I suppose so, and maybe not the, so much the union, but the individual contracts, right? Too, you know? It's much more complicated and lots of red tape to get an orchestra to do a thing, because now you're redesigning the entire job description for 80 plus people versus like one person who can say, I'm going live every week and you can pay me with a virtual tip jar or whatever. Right. But also what audi what orchestras and opera companies and that already exist have uh, is the, the massive asset of having an audience already, a huge email list and audience. So, so mm -hmm. the previous ticket buyers, now they can say, hey, we created this. But like you said, there's a lot of red tape. There's a lot of Hey, will you do this thing? This is totally not what you used to do. I know big orchestras in the U.S. right now are working on like creating some kind of sidebar contract that that says like now you have to do this thing. It's a live stream from your living room, and if you want to get paid, still at a lower rate from what you used to get paid. See, these are the things that you have to do, and so it's it's complicated, it sure is. So it's interesting to see how how it happens, and that's why. That's why growing an audience as a as an individual is a really smart thing to do because then then you have the ability to offer something to them whether that's private concerts or whatever it may be, um, you know. When situations, you you always have the opportunity. Either it's an online offer or it's back in real life again, and you're and you're and you're outside or you're you're at a hall again. You know, you still have that audience. So, okay, this leads me to my, my next question then, because since we're talking about right now, what can we do to survive as musicians during the pandemic, during the 21st century, what are some things that we can do right now, whether you're a student or you're a, a teacher trying to build a studio or you're a teacher trying to convert your existing studio to online, or you're like me, you're an orchestral musician and you've got no orchestra gigs. What are gonna, what's the first step we're gonna do after we have finished reeling from the shock? Like what's the first thing you recommend to do? Build your elevator pitch, write a grant, like go on social media. What do you think we should do? Yeah. I think, oh, go ahead, Caitlin. I, I was just gonna say something quick. I think it was like, it's kind of like you, you have to get really creative. You're like, how can I get what I do online? Like, how can I, um, how, how can I like morph it into an online, um, an online model that, yeah, like it's online sustainable model. Don't actually have any practical tools for that. And Tracy. <laughs> well, I think going back to the elevator pitch, what you just, what we've been talking about, 
Um, if you were to write down your elevator pitch and flesh it out into like a mission statement, and what and what that is is who you are, essentially, on paper, and then what that what becomes possible from that statement is splinter pieces, in in other words, content for what you want to tell the world about what you do, in smaller versions. Maybe it's an elevator pitch, but maybe maybe now it's it's a a Facebook Live or it's a Facebook post or it's an Instagram post or it's an Instagram stories or, and before you know it, you're sharing all about what you stand for and what your philosophies and your, all these things are based on that original elevator pitch, who you are and what you do and what you care for and what you care about. Um, and now you're, you're creating an audience. I think, I think the number one asset that anyone can create is an, is an audience of people who know, like, and trust you because what's possible after you have that or during the building of that is the ability to create income streams or opportunities for yourself without having to wait for somebody to ask you for um, to join them in their thing they created. So that's why I'm so I feel so strongly about the audience piece because hmm. what becomes possible is now you can say, "Hey, I have this thing and it's available, and you can pay me for it, or you can join me on it, or you can, you know." It's that's the first step, actually. So basically, you're saying get to know what you what's important to you, what you do, what what you're passionate about. Find basically the core of who you are. This is your mission. This is you who yeah. your your purpose, right? And then from there, it, it becomes clearer where you're going to step out in what directions, mm -hmm. right? And then what platforms you're going to use. And then once you start to dab your toes into the different ponds, then it starts to come become clearer. Am I getting this right? Yes. Absolutely. So let's not be afraid to find out who we are and try and try and try in this direction. And in the process of trying to find the direction, we have all, so all of a sudden um, discovered our followers and therefore discovered who our eager audiences are going to be. And therefore, yeah. eager audiences will be willing to consume what we have to share. Yes. Okay. I love Absolutely. that. And uh, keeping in mind that piece of the puzzle of your, or of your elevator pitch, which is a concern for what other people want. Ah, her as well. Listening to our audiences. Yeah. What do they want? What do they want? What yeah. do they want? Do they want Bach? Do they want Pachelbel Cannon? Do they want? <laughs> do they want um, um, covers of Billie Eilish? Like, what do they want? <laughs> right. Clear. And you'll find that the audience that wants whatever you're. It's a it's a give and take kind of situation, but yeah, absolutely. So that's also relationship building on a bigger bigger scale, isn't it? Yeah. Not just from the one, but from one to audience and back and forth, right? Yeah. But is it? Yeah, the internet is amazing too because like you can just reach so many, like that many more people. Like if you're trying to find audience members or people who are like 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 <clears throat> similar to you, like yeah, like care for what you stand for and stuff. It's like mm -hmm. yeah. Incredible. It's like the wild, wild internet west. I 100% agree. And we, we have someone here. Um, Marisa is here. Hi, Marisa. Stacy. Hi, Stacy. These are people that we've met online. These are yeah. people that I don't know necessarily in person. Luckily, I know you two ladies in person. Um, but there's so many people. And look, Lydia is here. Hi, Lydia. Hi, Carol. We have not met in person, but I know these ladies so well. Now they're in my boot camp. So the world, as you say, is wide world is all open and available to us now. And I think we all need to understand that we can take advantage of that and create opportunities and build wonderful relationships and build careers on top of those, those, um, those platforms. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, well, wow. People are saying great things in here. Um, ah, there's a question from my friend Miki, whom I haven't seen in so long. Hi, Miki. We studied from the same teacher, Lauren Fenuish. She has a question. On a social media like Facebook, one tends to have your own circle of people. So it's difficult to reach to audiences. Any remedies for that? Um, you mean that currently you're the people who are around you are people that you know, right? Is that what she means? I think so. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's called, that's like the social media version of networking. You know, you have to go to the party. You have to say yes to people who are friend requesting you, 
who are usually what I do is I friend I say yes to people who or I request to people who have mutual friends with me. So I know that we're already in the same network, but yet we don't know each other yet. And you gradually start to grow your circle. So right now, maybe it feels like your inner circle, but you'll be surprised at how much of your inner circle wants what you offer as well. And then you gradually, oh, you know that person? So do I. And like, oh, these are 10 other people that know you and I like you and I know you in real life. So let's meet those 10 people and those 10 people know 50 other people that all come like, you know, the seven degrees of separation music, the music world is small. The majority of musicians, if you see a musician on Facebook and you guys have no people in common, that's very, I've discovered that that's very, very rare. <laughs> However, you probably recommend, I bet you're going to recommend that we still allow that connection, right? That virtual connection to expand our network. Yes, because you can always block weirdos and you can always, <laughs> you know, you can always unfriend people. So like being really guarded and saying like, I don't know you in real life, then we can't be friends. That's like the opposite of networking. If you go to a party, pretend it's a party and you're like, initially you're going to talk to the people you know, but then that person's going to introduce you to someone that you didn't know and you're going to have a conversation. And then a few hours later, more people have gathered and pretty soon you know these people. So it's, it's a party. That's what social media is hopefully for. So if I, if I understand correctly, uh, Tracy, so basically we can approach social media as if we're the extrovert at the party. That's how we can break sure. our own personal um, already established uh, community of, of musicians. I think that's the question that, that Nikki is trying to add, ask, right? Is that, did I get that right? I, I think so, yeah. Okay, so yeah. don't be afraid to just blast out to many different strangers on the internet, right? Well, well, what I, I like to select people and okay. say, okay, hey, we have a lot of friends in common. Nice to meet you, you know, actually reach out. So you're not just like, I need 5,000 people, like as many as I can. <laughs> like you still need to try and meet them, you know, because then you might get into a conversation and that elevator pitch might become relevant. Hey, what do you do? Well, actually I create educational opportunities for young cellists. Oh, well, guess what? My daughter's a cello player. Um, what are you offering? Oh, well, this summer I have a thing. Oh, well, let me know. Forward me the email, right? Like pretty soon you might have a new client. So. You never know how it works, but it does work like that. Yeah. Well, I hope that people in the chat who have already submitted their own version of their elevator pitch have found each other and are friending each other as we speak. I hope you guys are networking right now because we're getting a live coaching on how to do so. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any more questions from anyone out there? There's a bunch of you listening. And since we have these very knowledgeable experts, I would love for you to ask your questions now before we wrap it up. I want to be mindful of their busy days and their time because these are very busy musicians and they're mothers and they have lives. So ask your questions now. And I'm trying to think, do I have any other questions for you? Oh yeah, I was gonna ask a question then. I had a question. Yeah, um, I was wondering like how because this, this came up in the course, but I, I I wasn't actually totally sure how to answer it. Like how you manage your personal um, like social media like face and your professional social media face, or if they're actually supposed to be like merged in together, ideally so that you, yeah you don't have two different or like how yeah like if you're gonna how to post things that are, are like I guess also appropriate on Facebook or Instagram, yeah. like if, if you're thinking of like a larger, trying to reach a larger audience? I, I think that it can be a hybrid, however you decide that however much you want to share with the vast majority of people versus maybe there's just, there's ways that you can segment your Facebook friends so that if you want to just share a few pictures with your immediate family, you can create a list that's just your immediate family and they only them, they see your list. And then you can use like the profile can be used in a way that, hey, friends, I, I'm doing this thing. Now all my friends know, but most of my business takes place on my business page. And it's like you kind of use them in conjunction with each other. Um, I do think that using your personal profile, because that's where you where you're at the party. That's what the personal profile is for. But you're meeting people there and you're going to tell them about what you do. So it's relevant to speak a little bit about what you do in that in that place. 
but then you can invite them over to your storefront at the business page if you want. And Instagram is sort of like already a hybrid like that anyway. It's kind of built into the platform to be like that. And you can be a business account that interacts with the personal accounts just seamlessly. So that's how in Instagram is different. And some people have, you know, a separate account that's just for friends and they don't care about who they follow and they follow, you know, like if your business account, you're going to want to follow people who might be more likely to be potential customers, potential students, clients, audience members. Say so you're always depending on what it is that you're promoting or talking about, or if it's a combination of things, those are the kind of people you're going to follow. And maybe, you know, maybe you want to have an account where you just like watch old friends, ex you know, excerpts, you know, like, or whatever, like some silly stuff that ends up in your feed or, you know, I remember one time I took over an account and the the news or the uh, discover tab was all this food, like close up food stuff, like cutting into a molten lava chocolate cake. And I was just like, wow, what were they looking at before I took this over? Like they're just food galore, like, <laughs> like cheese fries with all the cheese poured over. <laughs> Whoa. So like sometimes you, you might just want a separate account that you can just like for entertainment only. That's OK, too. But. But generally, you know, it's kind of blended a little bit, but you can separate it out how you feel. And it's really up to you. There's no real rule. So it sounds to me, so to, basically to, to wrap up, for, for those, okay, for, I'm trying to think about all the musicians who are, let's say, early in the early stages, before they've even started the career, and even some of us who are mid-career, maybe even late career. So it sounds like we need to take all of the skills that we just discussed, knowing what we're passionate about, knowing how to articulate it both verbally and in written form, how to communicate with people, uh, not just to network, but to build a community and to build authentic relations, but also to build a community online through online entanglements, shall we say. And all of this is to help serve us to survive in the 21st century. I'm sure, I think I summarized everything there. Did I get that right? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty spot on. Okay, yeah. I think this is, a, like, because I want to make it super clear why we're doing this, why we're talking about all of these different tips that you just shared with us. It's yeah. because we all want to make this industry work. We want to work in the industry, both, both ways. We need to make this industry work for us, especially with these virtual concerts happening and virtual connections, and we're no longer able to play in person until a very long time, we have to figure this out fast. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. no one else has anything else to ask, um, then, or, or if anyone else has anything to contribute, then I maybe have to say that that was a fantastic conversation. Oh, actually we do have something here. Lydia says, you do have to be somewhat careful about who you follow with a business account on Twitter because the Twitter algorithm will automatically surface tweets from people in your network to your own followers. So say you follow a white supremacist, your followers will start seeing white supremacy things in their feeds. Oh, interesting. Interesting. I didn't know that. Wow. Thanks, Lydia. And Carol said, Franklin Cohen, a well-known clarinet player here, accepted, accepted my friend request, even though I was just a fan. Yeah. Well, cool. that, that clarinet player knows how to network. <laughs> how to build an audience. So... Do you ladies have anything else to say lasting uh, anything? Where, well, actually, before we I uh, we finish, where can we find more of you? Caitlin, where can we find you? If they can uh, get in touch with you, where can they find you? I have a brand new Instagram account because I'm oh. in this. And I have, it's called uh, Miss Ice is Nice. And, Miss Ice uh, is Nice? Okay. Yes. Wait, can you type that in? Are you able to type that in? Wait, miss. Oh, I can try. Wow. I can type it in. Yeah, maybe type it in. All right. And I will and then, post some resources that you you gave to me. I will share that in the in the description notes. Right? You shared some uh, some resources. Yes. Yeah, that would be great. And um, also Caitlin Boyle on Caitlin Boyle from Dundas on Facebook. Okay, great. Yep. And Tracy, where can we find you? At Crushing Classical on um, Instagram and Facebook. Christianclassical.com. Wow, that was cool. Yeah, nice. I'm prepared. <laughs> nice. And you can email me at crushingclassical at gmail.com. So yeah. Awesome. Basically okay. the same everywhere. 
Okay, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and, sh and for sh sharing all of this um, experience because we don't get this, like I said, I didn't get this in school. So I'm really, really appreciative of you sharing this information with all of us. I think it's super important for us to survive together and to stick together. We're gonna make it through, right? Yes. We will make it through. Yeah, we will make it through together. So everybody, please share this talk. Please tell your friends to watch the replay because I think we all need these skills, not just in business, in, in the business industry or the sales industry or marketing industry or whatever industry. This has to happen in our classical music industry. We must survive this pandemic. Thank you everyone for listening. And thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Tracy, so much. Thank you so much. I'm going to thank say you. thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.